Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is Understanding the Neoplatonists. With me is philosopher Pierre Grimes, who is author of Philosophical Midwifery. He is also author of The Portable Pierre and A Dialogue in Heaven Between Socrates and Jesus. Mm. Welcome, Pierre. My pleasure. Well, when we talk about the Neoplatonists, it's a term probably most people have heard of, but few people really understand. Uh, I, frankly, just recently uh, came to understand that the Academy, founded by Plato, survived for many, many centuries after his death. Yes, about 800 years. Which is quite significant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Until the Emperor... Justinian closed it down. Justinian, who was emperor of, of the Eastern Roman yes, Empire. Quite true, yes. Mm -hmm. And the philosophers there had to flee, and they went to Syria. Mm -hmm. Did their work from Syria again, and some then left Syria, came back, but they were told no teaching, so they could spend the rest of their life in silence. Yeah. Well, I suppose the the fact that uh, some of them went to Syria meant that the, the tradition to some extent was continued in the Islamic world. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, very interesting Neoplatonists, you could include Al-Farabi, who was considered the second Plato, mm -hmm. and he did some good work on the Plato's Republic. Well, it's very interesting to me. The Neoplatonists are sort of the bridge between Plato and the uh, medieval world, uh, mm. in, in a way. And I see connections between the Neoplatonists and uh, Hermeticism and Kabbalah and Sufism and various forms of mysticism that spread throughout uh, both Europe mm. and, and the Middle East. But w let's start out with w why the term neo Platonism, and who are these people? All right. Uh, the popular view is that after Plato, there were many philosophers, and many of them have, said, have been said to have done very good work, including dialogues, including metaphysics and psychology, but it was all lost. Mm -hmm. So the only one we have comes 500 years later. Plotinus, mm -hmm. 270. Lost because of the uh, burning of uh, the library at Alexandria yeah. and elsewhere. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah just, it, it's a total destruction because some of the followers of Socrates were called Socratics, mm -hmm. and they did amazing work according to this and that legend. But we have no literary remains of their work. And, and it's all I, been destroyed. Am I correct in assuming that there, uh, this, a lot of this was done by Christian bishops and yes. uh, Christians who assumed that they just wanted to erase any vestiges of, of paganism, which they saw as somehow a satanic influence? Yes, that's true. And uh, they were vicious and brought about. Of course, later the Inquisition, and uh, uh, clearly the pages of history are blood-filled. Mm -hmm. And uh, these centers that did emerge are like gardens in a desert. You know, they 
able to flourish for a short while, and then they return back to a desert modality. I mean, for a while, I understand Alexandria was a center of Neoplatonism. Oh, yes, yes. Matter of fact, Alexandria was, uh, there were more uh, philosophical reflections going on in Alexandria in competition with Athens. There were more Jews living in Alexandria than the so-called Holy Land or Israel. Mm -hmm. It was the center of both. And Plotinus, uh, while he's called in the same tradition as Plato, it's essential to know that the what we call these Neoplatonists, they were not continuing the Platonic vision. They adapted it to meet their own needs, mm -hmm. though they continued in, in a certain degree the principal ideas but they did not include dream work, which was Platonic, which isn't well recognized, by the way. But Plato has a section that the only way you can get understanding mm -hmm. about yourself is through dreams. He did sort that of in, a precursor to Freud. Yeah, the, the, that, he did that in the ninth uh, book of the Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. That plays no longer a role after after Plato. But I, I get the impression that the Neoplatonists took the Platonic ideas a, a, a step further, one might say, almost in the way that the Tantric Buddhists took the ideas of the Buddha a step further because they got mm. involved in uh, the occult and the esoteric traditions and into magic. That's true. Uh, whether that that's an advance is something I'd question, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, like Plotinus, uh, what we know of Plotinus, it is uh, uh, by some authorities, Plotinus went through many dialogues, but the literary remains of, of uh, Plotinus were recorded by his secretary mm -hmm. as, as if they were short notes from a lecture. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's very difficult Greek to get into since it's so terse. Yes, but he he had the vision that the problem the problem with man is really simple. Uh, the soul of man, in terms of reality, is so close to the great soul, which embraces all nature, mm -hmm. that therefore we're only a step away from the divine and we can therefore nurture the spiritual development and enter into all mystical states. Mm -hmm. He didn't see the need for a dialectic. Very similar, I think, to the Christian Gnostics. Yes, that's, that's very close to uh, the Gnostics. And, and I gather there was maybe communication amongst them or that the Gnostics uh, derived inspiration from the Neoplatonists? Well, that's true, but the Gnostics then picked up uh, some of the uh, pre-Christian images and kept that floating, where yes. Plotinus did not. Mm -hmm. He, in fact, was against Christianity. Mm -hmm. But he also, if, if I'm correct, it was Plotinus or some later Neoplatonists who talked about the supersensual uh, sensual world that Plato yes. described as the world of pure forms as now being populated by angels and demons and other beings, spiritual beings who mediated between yeah. humans and uh, the deity. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, the next thinker, Iamblichus, was famous for that. Mm -hmm. he, like, he kept some of the major ideas of Plato, but then he said, the dialectic is artificial unless you gain entry into the sacred realm. And that can only be gained by theurgy. Mm -hmm. You have to set things in order and in place that represent the particular deities. And by creating that similarity among objects, mm -hmm. you're bringing about similar circumstances that will match a psychological experience into the superconscious. Theurgy would be another word for magical rituals. Yes, 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 I've heard that. And, uh, of course, the Christian church itself, I mean, one could call the Catholic Mass <laughs> a, a magical <laughs> ritual of sorts. People have done that yeah. for good reason. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Uh, but they, they're very cautious about making that distinction. But uh, 
nonetheless, that similarity exists. Yeah. yeah. I know it's a controversial idea, yeah, yeah. depending on whether you're a scholar within or without yeah, yeah, the yeah. church. But, but this notion of um, magical powers that can be obtained by interacting with these uh, intermediary yes. intermediaries between humans and the divine, they're not so different, one, I think, from the Catholic saints. Well, they look, there's some elements that are similar. Yeah. Yes. That's when he thought the dialectic could take place with the divinities mm -hmm. through theurgy or what you call magic. Yeah. But it didn't have a role among, among a, a spiritual seekers seeking to enhance the understanding and preparation for mysti mystical experiences. Why not? Um, I, uh, why he didn't, of course, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was there, but he chose that it's much easier for mankind not to go in this artificial dialectic that applies to... Now, the, we're talking about uh, iambicles? Yes, iambicles, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, as we did an earlier conversation about Plato, yeah. and, and it seemed as if... Uh, from our discussion, Plato really focused on the notion of the one. And if if we can, if I can paraphrase yeah, uh, yeah. the point you made, if, if we can learn to identify where we are unconscious, the things that we don't know and don't know that we don't know them, if we use the dialectic to find our mental blocks, uh, we can work through those blocks and thereby become closer to the one, to the absolute. You've just described a, a key part of the dialectic. Yes. Yes. And it's a purging. Yeah. Yes. And some of this got lost in the uh, emphasis on uh, the theurgy and the magical traditions and all the trappings of, yes. of the Neoplatonists. That's right. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there's a, I think there's a closer kinship to what is called Platonic thought with the pre-Socratics than mm -hmm. there is what we call with the posts or post-Platonic thinkers. Yeah. Like, uh, the central notion in Plato is the one self. Mm -hmm. Now, what, once we grasp that idea, one self, that means a state of mind. Self is a state of mind. Yeah. And therefore, when he called all of the ideas Every place he mentioned ideas in the most prominent places, he always added self. So self-justice, self-intellect, self-ideas, self-logos, indicating that he's talking about a state of mind, mm -hmm. not some abstract idea independent of experience. Now, I, I should point out, for benefit of our viewers who have read English mm -hmm. translations of Plato, that a lot of this has apparently been lost in the translation. Exactly. Yes. The, I'm, I've been influenced by the Balboa translation. He, he brings it back. He brings in the self again and again and places it so that it then can fit into a whole system. But wouldn't it also be the case that the Neoplatonists never thought of themselves as Neoplatonists? They were the uh, continuation of Plato's academy. They considered themselves Platonists. That's true. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Proclus and, and Damascus were the, the latest of the thinkers, were heads of the Platonic Academy. Mm -hmm. But they didn't continue it. There wasn't any, it appears to me that there appears to be no sense that these people wanted to maintain what we call the essential elements of Plato. Mm -hmm. That they saw that that kind of vision, the major ideas, they could adapt for themselves in the way in which they wanted to express it. Like the first teacher in, that, that we know of that wrote is Anophanes, and he was the teacher of Parmenides. And he said, hey, you know what? It's the whole that sees. It's, it's the whole that hears. It's the whole that thinks. The whole person, you mean? No. No? The whole. The whole. I mean, you, I, the universe. Yes. 
And people then who made comments about him living at the same time said, oh, they substituted mind. Mm -hmm. They substituted God. Mm -hmm. They substituted self. Mm -hmm. But he just said, it's, it's the whole. Now, when you say he was the teacher of Parmenides, yes, yes. Where, what date would that be? Which Parmenides are we just talking about? Yeah, okay. Uh, from, uh, from what we uh, can put together, Socrates was around 25 when he encountered Parmenides, who mm -hmm. was then some 70, over okay. 70 years. The same Parmenides as is mentioned in the Platonic Dialogue. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Because there and, was an earlier yes, philosopher named Parmenides. That was the Parmenides who did the great poem, mm -hmm. which is a magnificent poem. Mm -hmm. And his teacher, therefore, could have been another 50 years, perhaps. So we're talking about 100 years from, from Plato, mm -hmm. could be Xenophon, mm -hmm. or pardon me, Xenophanes. And following him, uh, there are a whole group of so-called pre-Socratics that are continuing that vision. Yes. Even Heraclitus is Platonic. Mm -hmm. If you mean by Platonic, he says the essential element to study is the nature of the Logos. The Logos is what directs all, all intelligent mm -hmm. beings. Yeah. It's the Logos that finally emerges as a one. Now, Heraclitus... Is, is one of the very earliest of the Greek philosophers, yeah. sometimes thought of really as the father of Greek philosophy, yeah. although Pythagoras is also accredited True. with that. But uh, Heraclitus, today people think of Heraclitus as, as the man who said you can't step twice in the same river, that everything is change. Yeah, well, you see, they, there's approximately 128 fragments of Heraclitus. Mm -hmm. People are not involved in understanding the whole. They pick that one theme, which does appear in several places, yeah. but they ignore the idea that he, he accepted the idea there is a one. Uh -huh. There is a true wisdom that is necessary in order to understand things, to realize that Zeus is common and can be described as wisdom. Mm -hmm. He saw wisdom as personified by Zeus. Or the other way, mm -hmm. uh, he had his idea of the soul and, and understanding. He said, "You know, man doesn't man doesn't have understanding. He participates in it." Well, these are Platonic ideas yeah, that, that came before Plato. In other words, there's a Hellenic tradition which That's is what, sort of continuous all the way from Heraclitus and Pythagoras through Plato, yeah. and I suppose Aristotle and the Neoplatonists. Yeah. That's the way I view it. Mm -hmm. You're quite right. Yeah. And it's a, it's a thrilling system, including people that we don't uh, study too often. Valesius, Zeno, these are all very profound mm -hmm. thinkers. Well, what intrigues me about the Neoplatonists yeah. is be because I've always been interested in the Western esoteric tradition. Yes. And you, you have the Hermetic tradition, which is sometimes mm -hmm. associated with the Egyptians. You have the Sufis mm -hmm. associated with the Muslims. You have the Kabbalists associated with the uh, Hebrews. Mm -hmm. You have uh, various strains of astrology mm -hmm. that stem from the, the Persians. And yes. all of these things are uh, mixed together during this time frame of, we sometimes call it the Dark Ages, but actually it was a, a vibrant time in, mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, and uh, these esoteric strains all got mixed with each other, including the Gnostics of, of Christianity. And uh, there mm -hmm. were, I believe, also Persian Gnostics. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Neoplatonists became a very important part of that whole mixture. But, but with Proclus, it takes a different turn. Uh -huh. He returns to, to Plato. He returns to Plato's Parmenides and opens it up for all of us. So mm -hmm. he, uh, the, the, there is one, of course, there's one proposition in, in uh, Proclus's Elements of Theology 148 where there is a way you can infer the existence of theurgy mm -hmm. when he makes that same point of having similar, a spirit may appear to be similar in a, in a set of objects, yeah. and that's the beginning of theurgy. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't express it, he doesn't play a major role in his system. But this whole idea of theurgy is connected, amongst other things, to alchemy. 
But it's not in it's not in it's not in Proclus. Uh huh. Who was the last of the? No, no. There's one more, Damascus. Uh huh. And just recently, uh, by Rappe, uh, she did a translation of Damascus. It's only current, maybe no more than ten years. Uh-huh. For the first time, we have in English mm-hmm. the the principles of, of Damascus. He continues. He struggles against Proclus and stays within his metaphysics and doesn't involve himself in the things we just mentioned. And he, of course, he was uh, the head of the Platonic Academy. I see. See, a rather curious shift occurred. Uh, um, This idea of the self being a central to Platonic notion dropped out. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't appear in Damascus. Uh, though I, I've recently made a, a study of how frequently the idea of self is mentioned in Proclus. Mm-hmm. I just did uh, oh, a yes. friend of mine do a complete printout. Uh-huh. And there's over a thousand references, by the way, to the idea of self in Proclus. But You're no actually one translates counting them. <laughs> <laughs> so, You're right in now, the original Greek. Yes, yes, from the original Greek. Yeah. So right now I'm engaged in trying to see its real mm-hmm. role. Okay. So I have a, a view of yesterday and I have mm-hmm. a view of today. Well, the, this emphasis on the self, yes, you attribute uh, to Plato himself. Yes. And then you suggest that the emphasis on theurgy, on magical ritual is, yes. I think, if I understand you correctly, you consider it sort of a, a decadent development uh, that is losing touch with the original Platonic emphasis. Yes. And equally dreams. See, Plato mm-hmm. said it's through dreams and visions mm-hmm. that I am what I am. Yeah. He says, oh, that's my connection with the gods. Mm-hmm. And Damascus, the last of the uh, yes. Neoplatonists, yes. even after Proclus, that's right. he, if I'm hearing you right, he's not emphasizing the self, but neither is he emphasizing theurgy. That's right. What is he emphasizing? Pure metaphysics. He wants to criticize the views of Proclus' view of the one. Mm -hmm. So he develops a hierarchy in which he has a more profound understanding of the one which characterizes it on, uh, uh, you might say, on uh, strict Buddhist terms. Mm -hmm. He touches again and again on nothingness. He touches on it. That's more. That's more significant. This idea than the one, uh-huh. and he develops his whole principle on that vision. And, and certainly, by that time, Buddhist culture has uh, spread quite a bit. He might have had some direct contact. Well, um, see, that's very interesting because uh, when Alexander the Great went on his great conquering trip. He ended in India yes. in a place called Taxlia, started a school there. <laughs> Alexander the Great's teacher was Aristotle. Yeah. And therefore he brought along with him philosophers akin to Aristotle. Mm-hmm. Into India. Yes. With the Pyronians, which is another school. Mm-hmm. And that Pyronians basically have the view, they have a dialectic without metaphysics. They mm-hmm. they have an argument very uh, uh, essentially that argues that whatever position you can take, you can take an opposite position, mm-hmm. and equally well you can take the both, and then you can say neither. Mm-hmm. So therefore it ends in silence. Which is very different than Aristotelian logic. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. But though that by bringing those people with him mm-hmm. into Taxlia, that was the center of Buddhism. Nagarjuna was born 40 miles away from Taxlia. Who develops that who same developed logic. That, Something can be both true and not true at the same time. Is. According to Nagarjuna, and uh, Aristotle would say, no, something is either true or not true. Right, right, because he's an empiricist <laughs> or a materialist. You cannot have both. So it's, the suggestion is that uh, Buddhist logic had uh, antecedents in, in this school of, the, say it again, the Pryronianism. Pryronian. Now, there's a thinker behind it called Sextus Empiricus. Mm-hmm. 
So there are many scholars today are awakened to the similarity between these two thinkers, and they say, if you read Narcajuna and you find difficulty in the way in which he's describing his ideas, just turn over and look at Sexus Empiricus. The, the language and the metaphors are similar. You can use one to understand the other, and that is to say you can use Sexus Empiricus, mm -hmm. a Greek philosopher, mm -hmm. to understand Narcajuna. So what, what you're saying now, Alexander, who was the student of Aristotle, brought with him to India uh, Greek philosophers, right. the Pyronians, right. who who were uh, opposed to Aristotle's oh, yes. logic. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Well, no, no. See, he did. Aristotle did have a metaphysics, and that's the strongest link to Plato. Mm -hmm. And there are several parts of it which were very akin yeah. to the whole dialectic. Mm -hmm. But he never filled it in. Mm -hmm. It was separated and uh, separate and distinct. Well, I guess what we have to appreciate when we go from Plato to Aristotle, mm -hmm. from the pre-Socratics to mm -hmm. Plato to Aristotle to the Neoplatonists, and and uh, is that typically, I suppose, in in any philosophical setting, you have a strong teacher, and then who who teaches mm -hmm. the students, and then these students, if they're strong themselves, they develop ideas in opposition yeah. to their teacher. Yeah. They need to question their teacher. That's part of doing good philosophy. Some people call it good. Uh -huh. See, we can put another thinker in that line, Homer. That's interesting. Most people don't think of Homer as a thinker. He, he was the blind poet. No. In the work of the Iliad, mm -hmm. you, cannot, you can see what Achilles went through yes. to get out of his great anger, he called the the ruinous wrath that brought upon Achilles, upon Athenians, such a great disaster. You know his hatred for Agamemnon. Yes. To get out of his hatred, he had to reflect upon himself, and in that reflection, that whole process of reflection mm -hmm. is very similar to the dynamics of philosophical midwifery. Uh -huh. Well, I believe Aristotle also acknowledged that poetry is a form of philosophy. Mm. Yes, but you see, Plato, Plato uh, takes exception to Homer, uh -huh. uh, and equally well, therefore, he takes exception to that kind of exploration of the human psyche which is found in Homer. Oh, and therefore, he never developed a midwifery mm -hmm. because he never he was he had for some reason a block against Homer, and that's curious. That and. As I recall, though, in our earlier conversation about Plato, you described how your development of philosophical midwifery was really inspired by Plato. No, uh, the, the, the uh, two parts. Mm -hmm. right. I recognize in, in Socrates, in Plato's description of Socrates that he saw himself as a midwife. Yes. But he didn't function the way midwifery does, as you can find in Homer's view and understanding of his key figure. Yeah. Well, we Achilles. also talked about Plato helping people to see where they were blocked, helping people to recognize their own unconscious. Yes, but he never went into the personal. He never went to see the roots of their ignorance. Mm -hmm. That's midwifer. And that's... Uh, that's Homer. That's what you find in Homer. That's right. I see. That's right. Well, Pierre Grimes, we've covered quite a range, all the way back to Homer and uh, all the way forward to <laughs> Damascus. Which that, that's a period of a couple thousand years. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Yes. Of Greek philosophy with many turnings. 800 BC to uh -huh. 500 or yes, 500 or so AD. So yeah. that, that, that's a lot of history, and uh, you've really helped to bring it alive for well, me. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pierre. Hey, I enjoyed it again. <laughs> yeah. And thank you also for being with us. Thank you.
We just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.